You love Wolverine and you love Wonder Woman, but we're here to talk about none of those things as we go through the best indie comics on this week's Geek History Lesson. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason, sometimes independent Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or independent creation from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about it in about an hour, except this week. What are we doing this week, Jason? Well, this week we're doing one of our famous lists, and uh, this list today is the top five independent comic books ever, of all time, throughout space and time con- continuum, I can't even talk today, of all the things. Basically, we have some rules here. We're kind of inspired by the movie Glass that is uh, coming out, the M. Night Shyamalan trilogy, that is based on no comic book. But is an independently, basically not Marvel and DC created yeah. s- genre property? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we decided that uh, we were going to talk about independent comic books, which I think are the forgotten comic books, when there are many great gems out there that are not published by Marvel and DC. And to do that, we pulled in a comic book expert, a man who some people would call the grand poobah of comic book podcasting. I'm talking about Steven Schleicher from the Major Spoilers Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Steven. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk about indie comics. Yes, did you know I was going to uh, bequeath you as Grand Booba of Comic Book Podcasting? <laughs> yes, I am now, now I'm going to write that on all my business cards. <laughs> we should put it on your fez. <laughs> um, <laughs> there well, you go. Well, Stephen, before we jump into our list and, and get the rules that we put down with everybody, uh, I want to ask you, um, I feel, especially in the comic book world, you know, comic books are so niche, they're very small, they're shrinking every year and year, you know, less people are reading comic books. How important do you think it is for people to check out independent comic books, especially when all they've ever read is Marvel and DC? Oh, there is a fantastic world of story and fantastic art when you start exploring the world outside of what I would traditionally call capes and tights. When you start going and exploring what smaller publishers are doing, when you explore different uh, genres of storytelling inside the comic book medium, you're going to find some fantastic stuff. And independent comics go from... You know, very little kid stuff all the way up to adult and very mature stuff. So there's something for everybody when we talk about independent comics. Yes. Um, Now, just to let everybody else know the rules for this, basically the only rules were no Marvel and no DC. So that means that no Marvel Max title can be on here. No Vertigo title can be out. They're out. But if they were published by any other publisher, basically not the big two, we would consider them an independent comic book. I think because they're the two publishers that are owned by giant corporate entities. Multinational corporations. Yes, exactly. <laughs> when uh, almost 90% of the comics sold each month are from those two. I think we can say Dark Horse, IDW Publishing, uh, and the rest, Boom Studios and the rest, image. can be called indie comics. Yes, yes even yeah, Image. Yeah. All right, so uh, please, everybody out there, let us know what you would consider your top five independent comic books as well on social media. And actually, where are those social medias they can do that? Oh, you can do that at geekhistorylesson.com, facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson, and on Twitter at GHL Podcast. And while we do encourage people to share your list, we definitely want to know what your picks are. Please keep in mind, these are our personal lists. We did not come together to make uh, an objective list. These are the ones that mean the most to us and we have found the most impactful so please don't fight anybody (laughs) because your number one pick didn't make it that's right because we want to know what your lists are so please send them out there and uh i I meant to say ashley but i'm gonna actually say steven we're gonna change it up we're gonna start with the guest first okay steven what is your number five best independent comic book of all time Now, I actually got a sneak peek, but I've already changed up my list a little bit from what I had sent you guys earlier. But since this is all time. Wolverine doesn't count. No, no, no. Okay. I would not have Wolverine on my (laughs) list anyway. But if we're talking about all time, back in 1987, there was a series that blew my mind because the art was so fantastic. It's a tale about a post-apocalyptic Earth where dinosaurs and humans live side by side with one another. 
and it's called Cenozoic Tales. It's by Mark Schultz. And the the cool thing about this is it ran on and off uh, between 87 and 95. It's not a finished series. Mark Schultz just kind of walked away from it, got too busy. And when you see the panels, when you see the pages inside Cenozoic Tales, your mind's just going to melt uh, over how good it is. And you're going to say, yeah, I can understand. It takes a long time to put this stuff together. Mark probably went on to go do other things. And if you're a Sunday comics reader, you've probably seen the the new Prince Valiant stuff that's running in comics. That's what Mark Schultz is doing now. But Xenozoic Tales is my number five all-time great independent series. And I know there's going to be somebody out there going, him, him, excuse me. Uh, there was a series of Xenozoic Tales called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs at Marvel Comics. Shouldn't that uh, exclude this from the list? Oh, no, dear reader, because Marvel Comics only reprinted the Xenozoic Tales in color. They weren't new original series. And, and I would also say to anybody that is bringing up that comment, slow your roll. But secondly, <laughs> also, I would say that if the comic book was originally published as an indie and yeah. then was later bought by, like, I would say Men in Black counts as an independent comic book. I, oh, sure. I really would, yeah. because, yeah. you know, Malibu was no big spender. But, uh, Stephen, where, how did you find the Xenozoic Tales? So, uh, Xenozoic Tales was published by Kitchen Sink Press, and when I was a young warthog growing up in Topeka, Kansas, I would go to our the local comic shop there, and uh, in the corner, they would have a rack of, quote-unquote, independent comics, and one day, Xenozoic Tales just showed up, and I was like, what is this? It's got pretty ladies and hot cars and scary monster dinosaurs. I'm going to spend a lot of money, because at the time, this was a little bit more than the 85 cents or a buck 25 that you would see for most comics. I knew I just had to have it. And the problem with a lot of indie comics, especially in the 80s, was you really never knew what the release schedule was. You never knew when a new issue was going to show up or even if your comic shop would uh, have it. So, uh, again, I would travel between Topeka, Lawrence and Kansas City uh, to to collect comics back in the 80s. And I would go to different stores and try to find these back issues of this series uh, as I was reading it, it's so good, man. I love that poll, dude. Because I, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what my list is right now. But I'm. I'm kind of the best of image. Is what my <laughs> top five <laughs> <laughs> comics are. So I love that you went Zetazoic Tales because I do know Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, and I even remember the cartoon. Yeah, there was a cartoon series based on it on CBS for a couple of years. I, was say, I feel uh, like it's one of those properties that would actually be prime for a, a reimagining for a new generation. Because, I mean, if you take, you know, dinosaurs and cars, there's going to be a market for it oh, in every definitely. generation. It's definitely. This is something that I think, if I'm not mistaken, I, I seem to remember that they tried to do a revival of the animated series or at least the old animated series just doing the reruns maybe like 10 years or so ago on MTV. Um, people can track this down. Even the animated series looked really good. But if you want to see some pinnacle art and a high achievement for indie comics, look no further than 1987's Xenozoic Tales by Mark Schultz. Awesome. All right, Ashley. Yes. What is your number five top independent comic book of all time? That doesn't work. What is your number five of best independent comic books of all time? I just want to pat myself on the back for picking um, an even older series than uh, the 80s. So I'm throwing back all the way to 1978 to one of my all-time favorite independent comic books that was originally published by the creators, then bought by Marvel, then bought by DC, then bought by Dark Horse, and now the, the beautiful husband and wife that created them have put all of these back issues up online. So if you are interested, you can find them for free. I'm talking about ElfQuest. Oh, I yeah. <laughs> love ElfQuest so much. Um, and when I was a little warthog, when I was a young warthog... Um, I discovered a bunch of ElfQuest issues in quarter bins. Um, I've told the story on a number, I think both the Major Spoilers podcast and Geek History Lesson in the past. And um, it was one of those reading experiences that was kind of like, okay, well, I've got five, six, and seven, 12 and 11, 18, all of the 20s, 35. And you just sort of put the story together from there. And when you're a little kid, you have a lot more patience to do that than I do now as an adult. But ElfQuest, if you are not familiar, I'm sure you're at least familiar with the art because it is so iconic. Um, it is written by a husband and wife team known as the Peenies. That's their last name. And it is set on the abode, which is 
A prehistoric Earth planet, except with two suns, though? I think that's called Adobe, Ashley. Um, it's definitely not. <laughs> I made sure when I was making my notes, because we added heavily in Adobe. That's why my brain wants to autocorrect it, too. Um, and it stars a bunch of elves, some of which are subterranean, some of which live above ground, um, and other similarly magical creatures. And it's basically their struggle to survive. It has been going on for so long that it has taken on a Lord of the Rings level mythology arc and story structure. But even in the beginning, it does deal with a lot of themes of the hero's journey and the characters that you're initially introduced to will grow up. They'll um, they'll mate. They'll have children. You get to see generations in this world turn over and you get to see how some of these things that were seeded all the way back in the 70s affect the characters that we're seeing when you're reading that 90s run and even the stuff that's coming out now. I think because ElfQuest, kind of in the grand tradition where people like to think of for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, because it just started out as the peenies printing this on their own and taking it like it's true blue indie comics in its um, origin, I think people sleep on it sometimes. And then I think because it has been around for so long, People find it inaccessible or they don't think that there's an easy way to break in. And I I would really encourage people to just go back and read it from the beginning. I also think it's an excellent, excellent story. And this is how to use a very distinct art style to your best advantage. And it's cool to watch someone draw a single series. It's kind of like um, what people liked about Spawn and what people like about Savage Dragon, to watch somebody draw um, a single character for years and years and then going on decades and decades and to watch how their art and how these characters evolve is like a really beautiful thing that you only get to do in comics and you really only get to do in in independent comics because no one anymore has drawn Batman for more than six if not twelve issues at a go and if you are someone who likes Fantasy Bent if you like Lord of the Rings if you like Bone if you like Prince Valiant if you like Conan I think you will find something in Elf Quest and I definitely had to put it on my list I knew from the minute we talked about this episode that that's what I was going to uh, that that's what I was going to choose so and they line ha- number five. And they have it all online now? All of it is online for free. And then um, Dark Horse, who owns the license now, just started publishing Omnibuy. And they're yeah. they're really stunning. So, But if you, I mean, I kind of appreciate that they have it for everybody at every, um, you know, at every level of dedication and at every financial level. You can find it all online. You just got to do a little bit of digging. I just love that they've mm-hmm. embraced the digital world for a comic book, uh, especially creators and couples that are, you know, not of the most current generation. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's really awesome. Um, and as a couple who creates comics, you definitely have to look up to the peenies for creating this empire of characters that they made from their own brains. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. El- ElfQuest, yeah. Is, ElfQuest is awesome. Yeah. The other thing is it's also a it's a, a closed story, meaning that they just finished this 40 year run. Yeah. I will say within the last year. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's something that definitely has a beginning, middle and end. And I agree, Ashley. That's a great, uh, a great pick there. Thank you. All right, Jason, the baton falls to you. Well, both of you elevated this list <laughs> and I'm going to sink it right into the mud. We're going to have some gritted teeth. We're going to have some arms that are bigger than they should be. And it's, <laughs> and we're going to be talking about a lot of hell because I, for my number five, I debated about putting this on my list. But when I thought about it objectively, I kind of believe that this might be the best known and might deserve the baton of the greatest image comic of all time. And that is Spawn. One of the only original Image Comics still being published. One of the only two Mm -hmm. that are still being published and actually worked on by the original creator. Um, Tom McFarlane, of course, was jumping off of Spider-Man. And he thought, how can I rip off Spider-Man? And and, 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 (laughs) be a little bit Batman, too. Well, if you actually think about it, yeah, be a little... How do I make Batman and Spider-Man make love and have a hellish baby? That's Spawn. Although, if you think about it in a weird way, he was sort of predicting the Spider-Man talk to the devil by almost two decades. I also want to give 
Uh, having not read Spawn, the most genius thing about it is it starts with SP, just like Spider-Man starts with SP, and people were used to going to the shelf to look for Spider-Man. Yes, yes, and and you have to you have to give. I mean, if you don't know Spawn, Spawn basically is Al Simmons is a governmental assassin who he dies when he is betrayed. He's sent to hell. He makes a deal with Malbolgia. He does not make a deal with the devil because, as you later learn in the storyline, Malbolgia is like one of the eighteen lieutenants that the actual devil has which is another and then he returns to earth as a hell spawn which is basically like a superhero with a symbiote this hell spawn is living on top of his dead corpse and it has all the powers and the crazy red capes and the thing you have to realize about spawn is that spawn is not just the comic book it is like sort of created an empire he has created mcfarland toys out of that which you can now find in walmart he has also launched the careers of many people that we don't know about, including Greg Capullo and Brian Michael Bendis. Without Todd McFarlane, without Spawn, we would not have Brian Michael Bendis writing Superman right now because Brian Michael Bendis wrote the spinoff title called Hell Spawn. But when Spawn came out, uh, it sold 1.7 million copies. Um, it attracted industry icons. He got... Um, Grant Morrison, Frank Miller, Alan Moore, and Neil Gaiman to write issues of Spawn. Um, and it's just one of those things where I am the first to admit that Spawn is not the greatest storyline. It, it, it's really not. Um, but there's something about the design of Spawn, the look of Spawn, that captures your attention that... Even when we go to a Barnes and Noble today, and I would see like a Spawn Origins, I'll always pick it up to look at the cover because it catches your eye. Whether that is the Tom McFarlane art, whether that is the uh, Greg Capullo art. By the way, Greg Capullo's career was launched by Spawn as well. Or whether that is the mo- uh, one of the more recent runs, John Boy Myers, who did a long run on Spawn as well. Todd McFarlane somehow baked indie comic book goodness into the look of Spawn and his green corpse head that was sewn together (laughs) with a shoelace. And for some reason, 300, almost 300 issues later, it's still around. It has not disappeared. I mean, in in fact, people who are familiar with our YouTube channel, uh, Jason bought a recent Spawn action figure that sits on our set. (laughs) Yeah, and and I bought that because I remember when I was a teenage kid, I loved Spawn. Now, I've gone back to it. I don't love it, but... I would say that if you are any indie comic creator worth your salt, you deserve or you should read the first 50 issues of Spawn Mm -hmm. because there's something in the initial runs of all those first image comic books that you can like feel them putting together. And the reason why I pick Spawn over all the other uh, original creators is because he was one of the few ones that actually got to issue 50. Mm -hmm. Hardly any of them got past issue 10 Mm -hmm. and he got to issue 50 and he's now at issue 300. It's him and it's Eric Larson on Savage Dragon and Spawn is infinitely better than the Savage Dragon. Although if people are interested in Savage Dragon, uh, listen to one of Steven's many podcasts, uh, The Dueling Review, where every once in a while they dip into it. They're some of my favorite episodes. Yeah, but uh, uh, so so this Spawn gets the number five spot. I would say not in terms of quality, but just in terms of legacy. I think if you're talking about independent comic books, uh, it would be folly to leave Spawn off the list. And that's my number five. Most definitely, because Spawn was one of those that uh, really captured everyone's attention, not only selling the millions uh, of issues per per, uh, um, millions of copies per issue, but also because there was a movie that came out in the 90s. There was an animated series that I think was on Showtime or Cinemax. HBO. HBO. Yeah, HBO. Uh, it really had a lot of people's attention. And I got to ask, the action figure that you have, is it one of the classic Spawn action figures where the cape actually is on hinges and folds so you can shape it and bend it uh, uh, how you like? It's not because I had one of those. I don't know where it is. No, it's the he did like a 20th anniversary ah, okay. that is like the main costume. And I thought as much Spawn as I read in the day. I thought I need it needed to go on the set. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's also an, another Spawn movie on on the way. I think this year, right? Yeah, in 2019. It will also. I, I just I just realized this now, and I could be wrong. Of the original Image creators, I think Spawn is the only movie that any of them got from their Image books. Am I wrong? Am I wrong about I that? I think Wild Cats. I want to say had something. 
They had I a cartoon. The only, the only like, one that's been cartoon series. Made. So, I'm sure they all had development deals at some point. I'm sure they all got paid for that. <laughs> but Spawn's the only one that actually made it to theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right. So yeah. That, that's an interesting thing because you would have thought all of them would have made it to theaters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So but, uh, there you go. Number five. As I said, I was bringing the list down. Shoelaces and corpses all together. <laughs> uh, Stephen, what is your number four? Well, let us shoot the list way back up into the sky. <laughs> In 1982, right next to Xenozoic Tales, if you knew where to dig around and you knew which comic shop to go to, you could find this series that was a throwback to old, like, serial heroes, like the King of the Rocket Men and uh, Commando Cody. And it was about this guy, this average Joe, Cliff Secord, who accidentally finds a rocket pack and he becomes the Rocketeer. And he's able to fly through the skies, punching Nazis in the face and helping save America here at home. And he has to do it while avoiding the mob, while keeping his identity secret from um, from his girlfriend. And also, as we later find, many, I want to say not many years after its launch, that the Rocket Pack may have been designed by one Doc Savage. I'm talking about the Rocketeer by by uh, Dave Stevens, uh, another series that was really hard to find in the day, became very, very popular. And even uh, we even have a movie based on it, a Walt Disney movie that came out in 1991. Unfortunately, Dave Stevens passed away and the series was not able to continue under his leadership. But currently, IDW Publishing has a bunch of new series written by a bunch of very talented uh, writers and creators but if you're looking for some original Rocketeer, if you're looking for some original great art from Dave Stevens, uh, then I would suggest going and tracking down that 1982 series. IDW Publishing a few years ago released a what's called an artist edition, which is this oversized edition of the comic that is essentially using the same size as the comic book um, page that the artists work on. And it shows all the pens and ink detail on that, including all the mistakes And if you want to see some great comics, that is a collection to get, except it's very, very expensive. It's about 150 bucks. But uh, go back and find the old Rocketeer stuff by Dave Stevens. I think you will love it very, very much. That is a great pick. And I'm going to be honest with you. I completely forgot about the Rocketeer while making this list. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the wild thing is, um, I'm sure we all did this. We all tried to do our research by looking at other uh, aggregate lists. Um, Mm -hmm. It's hard to find lists now, which I'm sort of glad that we're all diving into that are older than about 10 years. Um, So I'm glad that you brought up Rocketeer. Obviously, um, Jason and I are also big fans and took a lot of influence from Rocketeer and creating our own comic. And I don't know if a lot of people go back and read those original stories again, uh, like ElfQuest, because there is still new stuff coming out. So I'm really glad that you shouted that out. Yeah, Yeah, definitely go and check it. Check it out. Yeah. And I I think the movie is Aces. The the movie is great. I I hear that there's a new movie in the works uh, where they're going to have a different Rocketeer. It's going to be a I think aimed at a younger audience with possibly a female Rocketeer underneath the helmet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, our lawyers will be calling yeah, Disney soon. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, Jupiter Jet certainly owes a lot to the Rocketeer. We do. We looked at a lot of inspiration for Rocketeer. So I'm I'm super glad that you put it on the list because I did not. And- I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ashley, what is your number four? Well, I'm going to now bring this podcast back to my homeland of the Great White North for one of my all-time favorite comic book series. And I think I would be remiss if we didn't talk about arguably Oni Press's most famous offering, Scott Pilgrim. Uh, that is also on my list. But I'm not going to reveal where. Oh, do you want to talk about it with me? Uh, I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> um, so here's a protracted version of it. Um, <laughs> Scott Pilgrim is a, a young adult man who is very bad. I think he's 19 um, at not be, at being a, a grown up person. So he dates a high schooler and then winds up meeting a really cool American girl and has to do battle with her seven evil exes in order to prove himself worthy of dating her. It's a really fun framing device. Brian Lee O'Malley, who's the writer and artist, um, clearly pulls from a lot of the things that I think we're going to reference here on this podcast today that everybody here really loves and the reason that we all read comic books in the first place. But ultimately, this is a coming of age story, and it's about learning how to find your place in the world once you've sort of graduated from being your parents. And it's also learning how to be 
in a relationship. And I'm sure most people who are listening are familiar with the movie. If you have not read the book series, I would really, really recommend checking out the comics. Um, Oni has since done um, hardback graphic novels that are fully colored. They were not colored when they first came out. They were published very much in the style of uh, manga, just slick line art, little paperbacks. Um, For me reading it, it was one of the first comic series that felt like modern and cool and hip, but was also set in Canada. Um, As a non-American person who did not grow up in the United States, it's sometimes hard to feel represented in that way, and that's why this series stands out for me. And then I first read it when I was a teenager, and now that I am a grown-up person, I can appreciate some of the subtler storytelling that went into it. And I think that that gets left out in the movie because it's just the difference between having a single movie and then seven graphic novels to tell the story over. Um, And I think by the end of it, you really get to see why Scott and Ramona belong together, how they make each other better. Um, And I think that's something the movie doesn't do as well. I just want you guys to read these books. Please don't let your opinion on the movie keep you from reading this. And this was also, for me at that time, the first comic offering where I was aware of who Oni Press was. And Mm -hmm. they also publish a number of great titles. So I'm really glad that that broke free and kind of put them on my radar. So yeah, Scott Pilgrim, uh, he's got a sword. It's very fun. We'll see how many swords I can work into this list so far yes all right jason you said this was on your list i bet it's not your number four it's not my number four so what is your number four my number four is a book about a city oh yes it's a city high in the sky a city called astro city which many people might be like wait a minute that's a vertigo series and i would say haha gotcha it was first an image series uh for the first five years of its life and then it was moved to uh, Wildstorm, which was bought by DC, and then it was moved to Vertigo, so technically it's still an independent comic book, and actually I think it's the only fully independent comic book still being published at Vertigo, because if you don't know, Vertigo takes a slice of ownership, and I think Astro City is their only title that they don't take a slice of ownership. If you don't know, Astro City is the amazing Kurt Busiek and Brett Anderson series about Astro City, this world of superheroes, but it is a superhero anthology. Each issue is a different story, either about the hero, the villain, or the regular citizen on the street. There's a great story recently that they told about a woman who works at the Collins Center at basically the Hall of Justice for the Honor Guard, which is the Justice League of this universe, and how her life is crazier or insane. Um, Kurt Music's deconstruction of superheroes is amazing. Not only does Kurt Music have one of the best runs, if not the best run, in my opinion, on Avengers, he's taken all that superhero knowledge, and he's taken it over to this title where he can tell superhero titles that have or stories that have real impacts with real characters. And it makes you feel more than any Superman, more, any more Avengers, anything like that. Again, I, I'm bringing this list back down because we're going back to the capes and the tights and all that stuff like that. I don't know if you want to say back down, though. This is an Eisner award-winning series. Oh, that's true. Yeah, this, is a, uh, this is a really, really good series. You know, Astro City is, is, is just amazing. I mean, Alex Ross art. Alex Ross designs most of the heroes' costumes for all these things. Several issues of Astro City have made me cry, and it's very, I can't tell you all the times that a comic book has made me cry, and Astro City has done it more than once. Um, So to me, when you're talking about the best independent comic books of all times, of course I'm going to pick a comic book, because everybody thinks comic books are superheroes, and an independent comic book that deconstructs superheroes in, I would say, a way that actually makes you love superheroes and not just absolutely, absolutely hate them. I'm looking at you, watch them, a Watchman. Yeah, Alan Moore, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, but Astro City like takes everything we love about the medium, twists it on its head, and makes you sometimes love it more. Astro City, if you've never read Astro City, it is amazing. And the advantage is you can almost pick up any issue and mm-hmm. you can start right from scratch. And there's now, over 50 issues now, I believe, or it's, there's close yes. to like 75, I think. Yeah, there's 52 issues out of the Vertigo series, and then it's kind of, it's not ended, but what Kurt is doing is instead of going to the single issues uh, format, he's going to 
I want to say a collected trade oversized uh, yeah. one shot, uh, however you want to say it. And it should be very, very interesting. And if people want to know a little bit more of the behind the scenes stuff of Astro City over at Majorspoilers.com, pardon the pl- uh, plug. No, but uh, both Jason Inman and Matthew Peterson have done interviews with Kurt, starting with uh, Astro City issue number 13 and running all the way through issue 52, where they ask questions and Kurt responds about what's going on in the issues and why he approached certain aspects of the issue in the way that he did. And it's a great inside look at uh, how comic books are made and the thought process of, uh, of an author. Yeah, and you should definitely go check those over at Majorspoilers.com. I, well, that's back when I was working for Major Spoilers. I, mm-hmm. I pitched that article simply because I loved Astro City so much. And, and, to talk to and, I, and I wanted to talk to Kurt Music <laughs> and because Kurt Music is one of my favorite writers. And luckily he said yes. And it's a great way because it, it is like a writer's commentary mm-hmm. on each issue of Astro City. And yeah, there, I'm very excited to see where Astro City goes because if Astro City can do the one volume a year that is like 120 pages and it sells well, it could be a good signal post for the rest of the comic book industry. Just embrace yeah. the Japanese yeah. model. Yeah, and <laughs> exactly. And also, it would have been started by an independent comic book. So hey. there you go. Hey, everyone. We're interrupting the podcast real quick because we're going to be talking about a new sponsor, Myro. Now, Ashley, you wear deodorant, correct? I do. Well, it's a good thing that Myro exists because it delivers obsession-worthy, naturally effective deodorant that looks as good as it smells. I never considered that before. I have a deodorant that looks as good as it smells. It's it does a, look. It's a, it's a natural deodorant with a custom blend of essential oils that release over time to keep you fresh and barley powder to help keep you dry. Now, Ashley, Myro sent us a little deodorant stick Mm -hmm. little thing you used it tell us about it it is first of all it is slick it's an acute little pink package it doesn't look like deodorant so you can carry it around in your bag and nobody will know what you're up to oh that's good the secrets it smells delicious it goes on clear and for me it is really important to wear all natural deodorant and this is both all natural and effective what more could i want that's right now myro no they let you refresh every three months delivered straight to your door conveniently time for when most people run out of their deodorant so if you want to get 50 percent off your first order of myro get started today just for five dollars Visit mymyro.com. That's m y m y r o dot com slash geek history and use promo code geek history. Because guys, you want to do good, you want to feel good, and you want to make Myro an everyday thing because it's just like deodorant, except it's a little bit better. It's for the my and the rose in your life. So go to mymyro.com slash geek history and use the promo code. Geek history, and now back to the regular lesson. Uh, so that is my number four, Astro City. Stephen, what's your number three? Well, it sounds like Oni Press is going to appear on our list multiple times because Oni Press lands at my number three spot with the Sixth Gun from Cullen Bunn and Brian Hurt. Now we have reviewed all of the volumes of the Sixth Gun on the Major Heck Spoilers yeah. podcast, <laughs> but for those of you that don't know what it is, it is a weird Western tale uh, set shortly after the Civil War where there are six guns that can make or destroy all of reality. Each gun has a different property. Each gun has a different uh, 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 goal, each purpose. And our heroes are trying to prevent a bunch of bad guys, and there are lots of them, who want to uh, uh, grab all six of the guns and reshape reality uh, in in their own vision. And that could be a big nightmare. And so we follow these characters through, I want to say, like nine volumes of, of story. And there's not, uh, many people may know Cullen Bunn as a lot more of a horrific uh, horror writer in many of the other books that he writes. Uh, but this one is a little bit more just straight up weird Western. Yes, there are some scary bits, but there's not like people's faces melting off and their insides exploding out. I mean, that sometimes happens. Uh, but, yeah, it kind of uh, does, but it's also so beautifully rendered. So there's yeah, Brian that. Hurt. <laughs> yeah, when you're looking at Brian Hurt art, again, beautifully rendered stuff. Uh, this is a sprawling tale that I would love to see made into uh, an ongoing series. If you're someone who likes like Red Dead Redemption 2, or if you're someone who likes the Westworld series on HBO, then you really should be checking out The Sixth Gun. This is a little bit more of the supernatural, but I think the characters and the stories really play out in that kind of Western theme that uh, that I think is missing from a lot of comic books these days. Yes, I agree. And, and also the thing that 
is really amazing about Brian Hurt's art in that series is that Brian Hurt has sort of a Mike Waringo style where he's kind of mm-hmm. cartoony, but it in no way lessens the impact of several of these. I would say, yeah, there are several like horror beats in the six gun but it still works every time and for a western series you don't generally see a western comic book with i would call cartoony art you generally it goes gritty and dirty so the fact that brian hurt is such a great storyteller and the series works as a western is just kudos to the series i love it i have the big deluxe hardcover edition so jealous i was at the planet comic-con last year where he was there with the big giant omnibus editions and i was like i want to buy every single one of these except i don't want to carry them across the convention floor down to my car <laughs> that's why i get them from oh, amazon you could have left them at our table <laughs> steven <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh they're great six gun, six gun is that is one of my favorite series of all time and but has not made my list uh it's, I no, also think it's, it's a real shame that um i know it's had a couple pilot attempts but i think it would make a, a butt kicking television show yep yeah, it's also one that's a closed series. So if you're worried about, oh, I don't want to get into something that's going to, you know, go on forever. It's like nine volumes and you're done. Uh, they are very quick reads and it's very, very uh, much worth your time. Yes, I agree. All right, Ashley. Yes. What's your number three? Uh, I know both of you gentlemen have uh, read this series. I believe in its entirety. So please uh, feel free to hop in if you like. Once upon a time, there was a man named Jeff Smith. And once upon a time, Jeff Smith took it upon himself to create a also Lord of the Rings level fantasy adventure in comic books called Bone. You have almost assuredly seen this sitting, uh, if you're like me in your high school library, in a really, really, really heavy collection that you need two arms to lift. Um, The character probably looks familiar because it is directly based on the classic animated character Pogo. And it's basically, um, his name is uh, Bone, and then there are several other characters who look almost exactly the same with other Bone pun names, like Phony Bone is uh, the funny cousin, as you might imagine. And they travel around the world uh, with the human girl, the human milkmaid, which is a little weird, um, going on their hero's journey. And it's so epic in scale, but what I think Bone really achieves most is embracing the comic strip sensibility in comic book format. Because, yes, it's epic. Yes, there's great fights. Yes, there's moments of self-discovery. There's the dark cave. All of those things get hit. But uh, bone the bones are funny. And you really feel like you're just spending hours and hours and hours reading a, a Sunday paper funny strip. And it's a tone and it's a point of view that I don't think gets embraced a lot in modern comic books. It feels... Uh, at both times to be a throwback and very forward thinking. And there's a reason why, like Scott Pilgrim, it's got a new version where it's now in full color. It was originally just line art. There's a reason why it keeps getting reprinted. There's a reason why Scholastic bought it and printed it. Um, I don't think you can overstate enough how important it is and how if you are a writer and you're interested in doing anything that may be described as epic, that bone should be what we are all looking toward. And... With the Scholastic model, Bone is something that sort of operates outside of your traditional comic book market and does play directly to uh, libraries and education. And that's why I think it is commercially also one of the most successful comics of all time. It it really is. And and that's one thing that people don't think about when we talk about comic books is a, a lot of people just think the brick and mortar comic book shop. They don't think about the Barnes and Nobles of the world. And they certainly don't think about Scholastic Press because my kids are bringing home comic books uh, like the Hilo series uh, Amulet. that are uh, yeah that mm-hmm. are true that are true uh, comic books but they're sold and distributed through Scholastic Press and they get into those schools and the kids buy them and they love them and Bone is one of those that I agree with you Ashley this is probably the comic that has sold the most copies of any comic ever uh, just because it's been around so much and because the Scholastic keeps reprinting this. This is a fantastic tale. Again, another closed uh, volume, but it's like mm-hmm. 700 pages mm-hmm. in that volume. It'll take you a while to get through, but it's definitely worth the the read. Bone is the independent comic book that I almost put on my list, but I didn't. it didn't make it. And, and you're right. It, and part of it is, I, I, I said this on Spawn, the look of the bones mm-hmm. is very eye-catching. Every time I see one of them now in 
plush in actual 3D. It, I'm actually shocked we don't own one, to be honest. Well, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, but it's it, it just that cover, you see uh, um, Bone on that cover, like looking at his map. I've seen the Scholastic reprint. It catches your eye, and you're immediately like, what is this guy? Because mm-hmm. I don't quite know what he is, but he looks cool and almost like I could hug him. Yeah. But it, the whole series is great, and it is weird as well, like how Bone sort of takes every genre and smashes it together. Like, it has comedy comics. Mm-hmm. There's, like, a Western in there. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's like the, the first volume, I think, is called The Great Cow Race. Yeah, it, that's, mm-hmm. like, the second or third, oh, I believe. But, but, but I was going to say comedy is in mm-hmm. there because of that. Yeah. Uh, Grandma is so funny. And then when you think about, like, there's there's horror because the rat creatures are scary. Yes. <laughs> but uh, Bone is a great, yeah, definitely, definitely deserves to be on this list. Um, And if for if for nothing else, then I think you you did a good job mentioning the design aspect because... Bone does look like cute, huggable, sweet, um, but he's very ethereal. You're not quite sure what he is. So uh, if anyone is going to the Matt Grading School of Design, he would be a great character to look at. (laughs) Yeah. And also remember that Bone is this cute little cartoony character and his brothers are also these cute cartoony characters. But everyone else in the rest of the world are rendered like real, like real Mm -hmm. humans, Mm -hmm. real. The, The environment is Lush and detailed, and then you have these funny little cartoon characters running around. Kind of think of. Then we never really address why they're weird pogo creatures. They just are, and that's fine. Just are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, To be honest with you, I'm kind of glad that we did this list with three people because as of now, Stephen has brought up some stuff that I couldn't put on my list. Mm -hmm. Ashley's brought up some stuff that I couldn't put on my list. So I'm kind of glad that we uh, all three are able to make the ultimate. Definitely, I think we've proven there's more than five great independent comic books out there. I think we're gonna. have more crossover as we get to our ones and twos, though. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so it is my number three, correct? It is. Uh, my number three is probably one that a lot of people are going to sup- be surprised about, but um, I think it sort of fulfills the legacy of Image Comics. Yes, I, I went back to Image Comics again. My number three is Jupiter's Legacy by Mark Miller. Oh, wow. Now, when Image Comics was published in 1992, they were sort of a lineup of kind of forgettable superhero comic books. I mean, let's be honest about this. Uh, they were across the genres, but they were mainly superhero comic books because Marvel, all these guys were Marvel artists, and they, were, they that's what they knew. They basically did their own versions of the X-Men and Justice League and everything like that. None of them have ever been superbly you know, successful beyond spawn. None of them have really like captured the zeitgeist or done anything like that. And to me, I think Jupiter's legacy captures sort of the superhero legacy of image comic books and elevates it. Now, this was Mark Miller's attempt to kind of connect superheroes to the American ideal. And when you read this series, the reason why I think this is elevated above a normal superhero storytelling is because this is the story of America through superheroes. When you step back and look at it, and yes, it's scary at sometimes, and yes, it's annoying at sometimes, and yes, sometimes it's very offensive because Mark Miller cannot write a comic book without putting a panel in there that is offensive. That's just his style. I get it. You know, ease back there, sir. But at the same time, that's kind of also what America has become. Um, this, of course, is Frank Quietly's art. It's the first time they've worked together since The Authority, but it's bombastic, it's high octane, and it tells the story of the utopian and his brother who were Americans who had suffered the stock market crash of 1929. They go to a mysterious island and they find superpowers on this island, and it basically sets their entire life, and they become uh, basically these American superheroes. Now, the utopian, of course, he has these ideals, right? He believes that the United States is the greatest idea in human history. He believes the United States Constitution is sacred, and he believes that the island holds gifts that will return his country to greatness. Now, I would be remiss if I did not bring up that there is a lot of metaphors for World War II in what I just said. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I will say, um, at the time of this recording, you reading that description feels so timely compared to when it was published. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but then the series becomes, the reason why it's called uh, 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 Jupiter's Legacy is because it's all about their offspring who have all never lived up to the 
basically the giant ideal that their dads had. Uh, they have a public scandal after a public scandal, and then eventually it creates a rift between the two brothers to where one of their children just basically is like, I'm going to take it overall because this doesn't work, and the other child is like, no, it does work. But I know this is a recent addition, and I know a lot of people are going to say, like, why is this even on the list? But the reason why is because this is what... I want superhero comic books to be. I want superhero comic books to be a lens to the real world. And that is something that Marvel and DC do not do at all anymore. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And Jupiter's Legacy, the reason why I actually didn't read Jupiter's Legacy until last year. And it's something in it captured me. It grabbed me whole. And I could not figure out what it was until I realized, and I read some interviews with Mark Miller, that he wrote this as the history of America using superheroes. And once you realize that, this book kind of becomes amazing and scary at the same time. And also at the same time, it doesn't just make you think that superheroes are crappy and terrible. I'm looking at you, Watchmen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Jupiter's Legacy, if, if you read it once and say you went away from it or the art, the Frank Quiley art doesn't uh, interest you, I would say give it another shot because it is way deeper and way more layered than I think anybody ever realized. And I think he's always, Mark Miller has also said that he intended it as a trilogy and there's only two parts of it right now. Yeah, because it's Jupiter's Legacy, Jupiter's Circle. And that's it. And then Jupiter's Ascending. No, don't watch no, Jupiter's Ascending. No. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> but I will say that both volumes sort of do have an ending. Mm-hmm. So even if they never publish more, because Frank Wiley is a, is a notoriously slow artist, uh, there is enough of a conclusion there. And I would say definitely, definitely give it a shot. It, I think it takes, just like Astro City, it takes the medium that we think comic books are, superheroes, and it twists it and elevates it. Interesting. You've picked two meta narratives. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just, I just met that as an observation. I promise the rest of my list is not superheroes. Well, I think, I think if you look at any of our lists, I've picked a bunch of grand fantasies. Steven's got a lot of retro flavors. You can tell our tastes, I think. Oh, sure, sure. As we're making this sure. little list. That's yeah, yeah. all. All right. Uh, Steven, what is your number two? My number two is one that, uh, man, I rave about. In fact, my top two are ones that I rave about nonstop. People say, Stephen, what comic book should I read? And I will probably hand them a copy of Lock and Key by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. That's now, this on is my a... list, but it's not my number two. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> so here's, okay. the thing about, here's the thing about Lock and Key, and feel free to jump in, Ashley. Sure. It's a story about the Lock family whose father is horribly murdered. In fact, the, the whole family is attacked. The father uh, is survives and the family moves back to the family estate in Lovecraft, Massachusetts, this big mansion that's been around since the Revolutionary War. And as the three lock children are exploring the house, uh, they the youngest starts to discover these keys, these keys that do extraordinary things like you have a memory that you don't like. Well, you get the head key and you literally unlock your head and you pull out those bad memories. Or if you want to memorize the entire encyclopedia, you put a set of encyclopedias in your head and you close up your head and you've got all that memory. And there is an evil force that wants the power of the the lock house and the power of the keys. And again, it's a big, sprawling, epic story. It's horrifying. It's Joe Hill, who is the son of Stephen King. It's Gabriel Rodriguez art, which is mind blowingly brilliant. I mean, just again, I've said that for every every book that's on my list, not only are they great stories, but there's great art in these as well. Every page will draw you deeper and deeper and deeper into the story. And then when you start to meet the main villain and you start to realize what he's trying to do, uh, it just gets scarier and the children are put into extreme dangers. And I know some people are not big extreme danger for kid fans, uh, but it's but it's OK. There are people that die in this book. Uh, uh, it is a kind of adult. Uh, but in the end, I think the story resolves itself very nicely and very, very I don't want to say it's a happy ending, uh, but it's a it's an ending that ends just the way it should. Lock and Key is just so so good, and they're I think currently it has a mature this ending. That's what I would call it, a mature ending. It has, yeah, that's there you go. It's a mature ending, but it's not um, sad. It's not like a soul crushing or anything like that. 
it is one of those that it's finally a weight has been lifted off your shoulder and you take that big sigh and you're like, well, now let's deal with the repercussions of these events and try to move on with our lives. It's kind of left like that. Uh, there are currently three pilots that have been made of Lock and Key. Yeah. Uh, one that was uh, supposed to be on Fox like 10 years ago. One that was recently made for an attempt at Hulu. And now they're doing it again uh, for is it Netflix? Yep. And so we should see that Netflix series go straight to green light. It should be on sometime in the next year and a half. Um, Lock and Key, just such a brilliant series for you to pick up and read. A lot of people hear about it, but no one really understands how great the story is until they pick up Welcome to Lovecraft, which is the first volume of that series, and read through it and then they pick up their jaw and say, I've got to go pick up the rest of these books. Yeah. And I mean, I just can't say enough good things about. Um, uh, oh, my God. I'm going to play as a Gabriel Rodriguez um, yes. mm-hmm. about, about his art. It's so beautiful and ethereal and uh, kind of like Stephen mentioned for uh, Sixth Gun. It does take a lot of the bite out of these moments because it's just so stunning to behold. And he only gets better, um, you know, which you would hope, of course, um, across yeah. the volumes. And my favorite tiny detail about Lock and Key is the children's names. The siblings' names are Tyler, which means doorkeeper, uh, Kinsey, which means fluid or changing, and then Bodhi, which means body. And when you look at the way these characters are constructed and you look at the journeys that they go on, um, it becomes... It's just... It tells you so much about who they are and where the story is going. And it kind of when you get to the end, you're like, it kind of lays everything out. Like there's such thought mm-hmm. and care put into the series, which is why it was often late um, <laughs> that by the time it's done, you know that you've beheld something masterful. I know Jason started reading this on your recommendation, Stephen. Yeah, 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. Like it was it was 100 percent because of the Major Spoilers podcast. Um, I, I have a feeling I started reading the Six Gun off the Major Spoilers podcast as well. But the other thing that's amazing about Lock and Key, and I've heard an interview with um, Joe Hill about this, is that when he was writing the first issue of this, he admitted that he had no idea how to write a comic book. So the first miniseries. It's wordy. Well, not even that. The first miniseries, all four issues, have the exact same panel layouts as issues of Why the Last Man. Shut now, up! Now, he, yeah. he has not said what issues of Why the Last Man he was reading. You know what? That's fine. But he said that he, said that he enjoyed Why the Last Man. He loved it. So he literally just... Exactly. He was like, well, Brian, Brian K. Vaughn has four panels. I have four panels. Sure. Three panels, three panels. And he just wrote. The, so the entire miniseries is is a stealth copy of, a, of Why the Last Man. But it still works. That's fine. You know what? That's a, we recommend that as ways for people to learn how to draw comics all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. You could get a pass on that. Joe Hill. I also um, for my money, it's the best thing Joe Hill's ever made. Um, although I know he also enjoys a very successful career outside of comics. Um I just Lock and Key was also one of the first comics that I ever read where I felt like it was being made just for me. And that's a very special, very specific feeling. Well, it was actually. Here's Joe Hill. No. Oh, man. Um, I'm really sorry I didn't like horns. I didn't finish it. Um, it just the references that it makes really appeal to my sensibilities. And I think that this is the horror comic that you can give to people who don't think they like horror comics, the way you can get people yes. to watch something like Get Out or Haunting yeah. Hill House. Because it's smart. Yes. Because it's not... There's a reason mm-hmm. for yeah. the scary stuff. It's not gory. It's smart. Yeah. And and it's, and it's and the way it manipulates emotions is so, so oh, yeah. genius. Oh, well, yeah. Now, a little, little confession. When I first picked up this series, I had no idea... That Joe Hill was Stephen King's son. Me either. No and idea. By the, by the time I, I finished did. reading this first one, I was like, holy cow, this is like Stephen King done right. <laughs> it's like Stephen King could learn something from this. And then I found out later, it's like, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we could all come together to talk about my number one like this. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So, that, so Log and Key is your number one. Yeah, and uh, Stephen's number two. Nice. But I think now yep. it's time for my number two. Yes, it is time to reveal your number two. Okay, so... I felt like I couldn't make a list of uh, top indie comics or whatever it is we've decided to title this episode uh, without bringing up a slice of life or biography comic, because that is a huge part of the genesis of independent comics. And I think especially in a post zine, post 1980s world, it's a lot of what you think about um, when you think, I think, stereotypically about um, 
what independent comics are. And so I want to talk about Smile by Raina Telgemeier. Great pick. Um, I've also screamed about this on a number of podcasts, so I'm sorry if you've heard it before. Raina Telgemeier is the single most successful comic book writer in the world. She is the reason the New York Times no longer has a top graphic novel section because she was uh, number one for like 15 years. And uh, like Bone, her books are published directly through the Scholastic graphic novel imprint, which is called Graphics with an X. And Smile is the story of uh, her experiences with braces growing up. I read this as uh, an adult person. I think it was in my mid-20s at the time. Um, having once been a young girl and having once had braces, it appealed to me on a number of levels. But she does everything. She writes it. She draws it. She tours around the world and promotes it. Um, in the craft of comic book making, I don't know if you can get much better than this. And I think it slips, again, below the radar because this is a kid's book and because it is aimed at a middle grade audience and because it is aimed particularly at females. And I think whether or not you want to write the next Watchmen, which uh, we all respect, though it has been much maligned on this podcast today, or you want to write the next Smile, I think you'd be remiss to not check it out because there's an economy of storytelling here and in that economy it gets right to the heart of what is so wonderful about comics and about a personal story i've read a lot of slice of life comics i've read a lot that are very boring and this is not that and while you might not think a girl getting braces can make for compelling storytelling it truly can uh and when i bought it from reina telgemeier at uh San Diego comic-con a couple years ago she asked me if i wanted it signed for my daughter who i don't have and i said no thank you it is for me because even as an adult i think you can get a lot out of it so i knew i was definitely going to put smile on my list and I also think both of you gentlemen have read it as well. Yes, I have. It's great. Yep. Very good. I'm glad Random Tuggermeyer could uh, come on this list because, again, she is kind of the future of independent comics. Although there is an argument to be had, and I, and I, and I won't call you on it because I think it's a fine choice. Is something published through Scholastic independent? Because Scholastic is one of the largest publishing companies in the world. You know what? Our rules were not Marvel and oh, DC. No, no, no. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I know. I know we're not. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, not but yeah, that yeah. just goes the show as yeah. well. I think the future of the comic book industry is mm-hmm. like, yeah, what do you consider a, when a book publisher yeah. publishes a comic book? Uh, because I think that's going to happen more and more as we go forward. I think so, too. Um, and the reason that I picked Smile instead of Ghosts, I know Ghosts um, enjoys more critical acclaim, although all, all of her books review incredibly well, um, is because Smile is the first one that I read. So it's the one that uh, I have the most personal connection to. So it is my number two. Jason, you are number two. Who is your number two? I am not a number. I am a free man. <laughs> <laughs> I got to make that joke instead of Steven, so I feel yep. really important. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the first time I've ever done an impression of Patrick McGuhan on the podcast. It was good. <laughs> Thank you. It's one of my favorite series of all time. Uh, sadly, not on this list. Uh, <laughs> but there is a prisoner comic book series, unfortunately, published by Marvel originally. Uh, we cannot include it. All right. Not independent <laughs> enough. Um, my number two is sort of a biographical comic book, but hidden under a kind of a mystery slice of life. Um, it is a comic book about uh, your homeland, Ashley. Hey. I am talking about the Essex County trilogy. I almost put this on my list, but I felt confident you would have Jeff Lemire show up somewhere. Yes, <laughs> uh, because I am a huge, huge Jeff Lemire fan. Uh, uh, Jeff Lemire of the last couple of years has, has strongly climbed to probably my favorite working comic book writer right now um, because I think he really gets to the the heart of things. But this was published in 2011. It is stories about Essex County, Ontario in Canada. And it's three short stories collected in one volume. It's called Tales from the Farm, Ghost Stories, and The County Nurse. Now, if you've never read a Jeff Lemire story, especially some of his independent work, and I'm not talking about his work on Just League Canada or, you know, his work on Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm talking about, like, his stuff that he draws himself with the tiny little eyes and the tiny little necks and the, the huge noses the sometimes. Big ears, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> He really cuts to the heart of emotion, I think, more so than a lot of comic book writers today. Now, a lot of that might be because he draws his own material, so he knows exactly how to feel it. But he takes these stories about places and activities that most Hollywood executives would laugh you out of the room if you pitched to them. But he makes them work and he makes them compelling. In Essex County, one of the stories is about young Lester, who is a boy who was orphaned after the death of his mother, and he has to end up living with his Uncle Kenny on a farm. 
Now, Lester and Kenny couldn't be further from each other because Lester likes superheroes and he likes to draw comic books. And, you know, uh, Uncle Kenny just likes to watch hockey. But it's one of these stories that is sparse with dialogue. It's black and white, and it illustrates the desolate winter Canadian countryside. Also, it also tells the story of this young hockey player named Jimmy LaBeouf, Mm -hmm. who is uh, down on his luck. He's running the gas station. He had great dreams. He had a girlfriend, but all of his dreams were dashed. And when you learn his story and how he ended up in this gas station, it is it will punch you in the heart. It's full of loss and regret because we all feel those emotions. We all know what those emotions feel like. And to be honest with you, something that is a strength of Essex County, which I do think is probably Jeff Lemire's one of Jeff Lemire's best works, if not his best work of all time. And the reason why I made my number two list is because comic books don't, or excuse me, comic book characters generally don't feel like real people. Essex County feels real. I feel, and the reason why I called this an autobiographical comic book, I think these are based on real people. I think Jeff Lemire knew these people, and I have a feeling that Jeff Lemire might have been Lester. Um, I I share that personal theory, but I will say... um, I grew up and I w- I've been in Essex County mm-hmm. more than once. Um, and if these people were not his family, like these are real people. These, these are, are so real, real people. Canadian people. Yeah, it, it just feels so real. And that's the reason why this comic book grabbed me. And that's the reason why I think it deserves to be on this list. So if you've never checked out Essex County, you definitely should do yourself a favor and read it. Because I do not want to tell you anything more. Because I think every emotional beat of the story grabs you. There's no superheroes. There's no magic. It's just people living in Essex County and the stories of their lives. And I I will uh, uh, fight you if you do not think it's one of the most compelling comic books you've ever read. It is um, also another one that is a huge tome, but it reads very quickly. Yes, just, that's an advantage of Jeff Lemire. Is Jeff Lemire does these things, especially on his own comic books, where he is, again, very sparse with dialogue. If he doesn't need a word balloon, he doesn't use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love this book. Uh, I got two Canadian books on this list so far. Well, good eh? Uh, I'm so <laughs> proud. Uh, yeah, I really love Essex County. I thought it was interesting that that's the one that you chose. Uh, well, I to be honest with you, I, and I will in all honesty, I think Royal City, his most recent version mm-hmm. Canadian tale that he just did last year, it's 15 issues, is much better than Essex County, but... It's very new. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the best independent comic books of all time, I don't think it deserves because Essex County is what got him hired at DC. It is is Essex County. So I I think maybe, you know, if we were to redo this list, maybe five, ten years down the road, uh, it might flip to Royal City. Also, we just talked about Royal City on the last episode. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) All right. So we are here at the number ones. We already know awesome. what Ashley's number one is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we have an idea of what your number one is. I think we know exactly what my number one <laughs> yeah. is as well. Uh, but we don't know what Steven's number one is, so well, Steven surprises. I know what it is. And I Ashley think I, knows what I it think is. I could have guessed it, even if I hadn't I, I, previously just peeked at your list. <laughs> I, I scream a lot about lock and key, mm. but you know what? I'm kind of a science nerd. I went in, when I went to college, I had two choices. I could go over into radio, TV, film. Or I could go over into physics. And I really, really wanted to go into physics, except there was this allure of of uh, of radio TV that uh, that pulled me over there. So I've always been a big fan of science. Then did you want us to yell science? <laughs> science. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's your cue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then I, I want to say like in 2007, this comic came out from uh, Red Five Comics, which is super independent comic book. And called Atomic Robo, and I was like, what the heck is an Atomic Robo? And I start flipping through it, and it's set in World War II, and there's this robot that comes out and starts punching Nazis in the face, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is cool. And then he meets another giant robot that's going to kick his butt, and he just goes, ah, crap. And I'm like, oh, this is like Hellboy for science people. And I just could not get enough of Atomic atomic Robo from uh, Brian Clevenger and Scott Wegner. This is a fun series It is one that is told in volumes in that uh, like volume one will take place in World War Two and it tells a World War Two story and and volume uh, two will take place uh, in um, um, I think the Korean War. Then you've got another one where he's dealing with um, uh, science conspiracy stuff and uh, interacting with real people from history 
you know, he was created by Nik- Nikola Tesla. There's an ongoing war between him and Thomas Edison uh, throughout the series. Uh, he uh, he makes fun of Bill Gates by writing some bad stuff about him on Mars. Uh, Atomic Robo is just all over the place, different settings, different time periods, but they're always really, really great stories. And the thing that I like best about Atomic Robo is the attention to detail and the actual historical research that Brian Clevenger has to go into uh, into each volume doing. Uh, it's full of, of accuracies. Uh, there's one uh, called the the Golden Circle, uh, Knights of the Golden Circle, which is just fascinating. Uh, I had had a chance to talk with Brian about that series and the amount of research that goes into each individual uh, story that they're working on. Um, it is it's good. It's funny. It's got high adventure. It is sometimes it, it takes you places where you don't expect it to go. Uh, but it's always a good time. If you want to see Atomic Robo fighting giant uh, kaiju monsters, this series has it. If you want to see him uh, knocking back with Carl Sagan, this series has it. If you want to see him punching Nazis in the face, this series has it. Best of all, this series is completely free. While it started at um, Red 5 Comics, it quickly moved to their own imprint and then online at AtomicRobo.com. But it's also being published and collected at IDW Publishing. So you can get it in print or you can go and read it for free over at AtomicRobo.com. Atomic Robo just rules. It is the best. Everyone needs to go check it out. It is great as well. This is another comic book that I picked up because Major Spoilers Podcast talked about it. Uh, it is great. And they also do Kickstarters here and there where they do super fancy yes. hardcover editions. And I, yep. I scoop up every one of those hardcovers every chance I do. I ha- I have done that as well, and uh, depending on how, how far you want to go on that Kickstarter, you could get a Tesla Dyne uh, lab coat. Yeah, or you're going to be drawn into the comic book. But the the amazing thing I, about I'm in one of those comics. I'll are just you say really? That. Which I one are tell you? Tell you which one. I won't tell you which one, but uh, it's one of the early Kickstarters that they did. I want to know. Uh, <laughs> so interestingly enough, the other thing that they have done is that they have also moved completely to a Patreon model. Where the comic mm-hmm. book is entirely funded through Patreon, and yeah, you're right. They release, I think, a new page every day on AtomicRobo.com. Every, every every other day. So they've got two series that are going on. They have Real Science Adventures, which are some of their secondary characters, and then they have the Atomic Robo stuff. And I think Atomic Robo is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Real Science Adventures is Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah, but that's just that's amazing. Talk about taking independent comic books to the furthest reach to the fact of, you know what? People are going to pay us directly just to mm-hmm. make this comic book, and we're just going to put it online for free. Now, I hope Atomic Robo never ends, and the amazing thing about Atomic Robo as well is that it doesn't matter what volume you pick up. You right, can they're all standalone. They're all standalone, but they have continuity. That's the mm-hmm. amazing thing that they have created with that series. And you're right. I remember when it first came out through Red 5, I was like, what is Red 5? Yeah, that was, I mean, Red 5 had like three really good comics on launch. Uh, Atomic Robo was the only one that stuck around. And of course, Red 5 is still around. It just doesn't publish as often as it did. One of the the fascinating things um, about Atomic Robo is that, it, again, so much science that goes into it, but there's so much humor and love being poured into the series that I, I really can't get enough of it. And it's just, it's just wow. That's all I can say about it is wow. You're exactly right. And the art is uh, pretty damn. The design of Tom Robo is, again, very eye catching. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you'll say, oh, there's a little bit of Iron Giant in there. There's a little bit of, you know, you pick a pick your favorite robot. Uh, but it is a very iconic robot, uh, very iconic poses that he goes through. He does get destroyed and gets rebuilt mm-hmm. uh, as the as uh, Scott Wegner's uh, art style changes over time. And as they bring in other artists to to work on it. So they have a whole series where his. He basically only has a head and they have to rebuild his body from scratch and he comes out with a whole new body. It's it's very cool. Okay, that is a great number one choice. Ashley, your number one is what again? Lock and key. It's real scary. Oh my gosh, that's such a good. I'm glad you put that on your list. (laughs) I knew I had your back on this. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, because I think I jumped on when uh, Stephen was talking about it for the number two. Uh, uh, they make nice hardcovers of them now, so buy those. Yes, you can collect it all in three volumes. Yeah. They're very nice, except for the miniseries. Yes, that's true. That are uh, extra. All right, Jason, blow our mind with your number one. Well, my number one, as you know, if you've been keeping track, is <laughs> Scott Pilgrim. I think, uh, and, and the reason why I wanted to leave it for number one is, 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 the reason why I think it is number one is because I can think of no other independent comic book that has blown up and made such a huge impact as Scott Pilgrim. 
Scott Pilgrim is a video game. There are still Scott Pilgrim toys. There was a movie, and that movie hit hard. Even though that movie didn't do well, that movie was huge. And I challenge you to have any idea what Oni Comics was or Oni Press was before Scott Pilgrim, the first volume, released. Right. Scott Pilgrim made Oni. Oni is a functional company, and we get great other Oni series like Six Gun, like Letter 44, like The Bunker, uh, because of Scott Pilgrim. And I remember talking to the uh, editor-in-chief, he's not the editor-in-chief anymore, but he was a couple years ago, at San Diego Comic-Con and asking him at his booth, be like, what's the best-selling book you have? And he said, it's always Scott Pilgrim. Every single year at San Diego Comic-Con, the best-selling book at their booth is Scott Pilgrim. And Scott Pilgrim came out in 2004? That was when the first volume came out. That is insane that almost 15 years later, we are... It's still their best-selling book at San Diego Comic-Con, especially now that they have a deep catalog of titles that I would say are equal of Scott Pilgrim in terms of quality. Yeah, Um, and the final volume of Scott Pilgrim came out almost a decade ago. Yeah, like right the same year as the the movie. As the movie, yeah. um, I think Scott Pilgrim, to me, when I think of independent comic books, the story of this boy in love with a girl mixed with video games, I think has had more of an impact on pop culture than any other in, independent comic book we've ever thought of. And that's the fact that also it's it's good. It's actually a great comic book. Again, so if you've only seen the movie, I echo Ashley's sentiment. Go read the book. There's just a lot more going on. Well, to me, when I was thinking about this list, I knew Scott Parker had to be on this list, and immediately I was like, it has to be number one. Like, there's no other independent comic book that I can think of that has made as much of an impact and is as good as Scott Pilgrim. You still see people cosplaying it to this day. There's mm-hmm. always at least one girl dressed up as Ramona Flowers with a hammer, yep. um, usually with uh, a Scott Pilgrim. And I still see those SP shirts and the, is it Plumline shirt that Scott wears? Like you still see oh, yeah, Scott's shirts and stuff like guys that, yeah. wearing Scott's shirt around and I'm like, is this cosplay or did you just wear this today? Well, I mean, just think about it too. <laughs> like it was only a couple of months ago that Pop Funko released this Scott Pilgrim line. Yeah, the Pop Vitals, that's right. And Pop Funko doesn't release their any of those lines unless they think it will sell. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I've heard, read articles about their marketability of how they determine, like, what they choose. And it's pretty money-based. Like, they don't, they don't, they only do a line if they think they can sell them all. And the fact that they chose Scott Pilgrim a couple of months ago shows the power of that story, the power of that independent comic Well, book. I'm going to call it right here because I honestly can't believe it hasn't happened yet. I'm shocked we don't have a Scott Pilgrim TV adaptation yet. An animation for, for series. For streaming. I would love to or see an animated. Or live action, either or. But like with the Hulu, Netflix, Amazon sort of paradox that we have going on right now. Like more accurate to the book, yeah. Yeah, or or... You know, whatever. You can go more or less accurate, but just going more in depth. Like, we didn't get to see a lot of the big fights that happened and things mm-hmm. like that. True. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And again, I think that's the one thing that people who are listening to the show need to really understand. If you've only seen Scott Pilgrim from the movie, the book is radically different, especially in the third act. Yes. And so the books, in my opinion, are much better than the movie. The movie's fine. It's got some great actors in it. It's got all of your favorite superheroes in it. Uh, but the That's third act now. of the movie is just <laughs> awful. Uh, so real quick, uh, I wanted, before we go into the ending of the podcast, I wanted to say if anybody had any honorable mentions, I mentioned Bone, mm-hmm. uh, that almost made it on your list, it, 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 but you just couldn't fit them on there. I mean, for me, Lock and Key was one of those, and also mm-hmm. Ex Machina by Brian K. Vaughn. Uh, Invincible mm-hmm. was almost, was on my list, and then I took it off my list. Um, I think as far as Kate's in type, capes and tights go invincible is like comic book candy yeah yeah i had hellboy down which is again just yeah. love 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 that that series chilling adventures of sabrina made my list uh, in my first cut because i was just like this is a series that i didn't think they they would be able to pull off and they've done it so well and then the final one is a detective noir series from ed brubaker and sean phillips called the fade out 
Oh, nice. So I, I consider putting criminal on my list almost. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. So let's move into the final section. Oh, real quick before we get to the final section of our podcast. If you are interested in any of the comic books that we have picked, uh, our top three choices will be on our recommended reading. Ashley, where can they all find that? That's at geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. Everything we've ever recommended is there. There's a sweet Amazon widget. You click that, you buy it. A little bit of support comes to help us keep the lights on here at the Mind University. Yes. And speaking of support, we're going into the final section of Geek History Lesson called The Honor Roll, where if you go over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and you leave us a five-star review, you help bump us up in the Apple algorithm, and we don't care what you say, you could insult us. Uh, we have two new people joining The Honor Roll this month. Uh, who are those, Ashley? The first is IA Thomas 77 who says, just another five-star review. I love how casual that is. Doomed Planet, dot, dot, dot. Desperate Scientist, dot, dot, dot. Last Hope, dot, dot, dot. Great podcast. One of my favorite reviews to date. <laughs> we also have uh, Forge joining the honor roll. He says, thanks, Jason and Ashley. You are truly great at making an extremely good and geeky educational podcast. They are very knowledgeable, entertaining at the same time. I'm fairly new to the podcast world and so happy I found it. All right. So thank you to everybody who leaves us a five star review on iTunes. And speaking of amazing podcasts, because you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, you should also subscribe to all the amazing podcasts that Steven does. Steven including the Major Spoilers Podcast, Top 5, Critical Hit, the Legion Clubhouse. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Please tell everybody where they can find your podcast and everything and all the awesomeness that you do. If you want to find about uh, all about comic books and pop culture, find it at Majorspoilers.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at Major Spoilers. Sweet. That's very simple. Uh, just letting everybody know real quick, uh, you know, you should go over to Major Spoilers over the next three weeks because unlike Steven... Uh, we're going to be taking a break. Yes, we are. Yes, we're taking a slight sabbatical because we have a bunch of projects coming up and we're working on a bunch of stuff and I'm trying to finish a prose book right now. Uh, so for the next three weeks, there will not be an episode of Geek History Lesson. So if you're bored and you're worried about us, I suggest going over to Majorspoilers.com because there's plenty of awesome good podcasts over there. But for the weeks of uh, 121, 128, and 2.4, we will not be airing in a Geek History Lesson episode. There will be no Geek History Lesson extra, uh, so sorry about that, but, you know, I gotta I gotta start doing some typing. I gotta do a bunch of stuff, and, you know, and, uh, but we will be back on February 11th to celebrate the five years of Geek History Lesson with a very special episode, the history of a certain someone that has been highly requested and talked about a lot. Ashley, why don't you reveal who the history is to celebrate our five-year anniversary? Well, that is a uh, comic creator extraordinaire, host extraordinaire, director extraordinaire, Mr. Jason William. In me. Yep. We're doing the Geek History Lesson on me in a self-indulgent episode. Who's it taught by? Uh, we'll, we'll save that. Okay. We're going to save. But taught by a very special guest. A very special professor was flown in to teach this lesson. It's not even a lie. No, it actually was <laughs> flown in. So it's, I'm looking forward to that episode. Uh, don't worry. We'll be back soon. And uh, please enjoy our over 200 episodes uh, as you're waiting for the break. Uh, Steven, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Oh, thank you. This was such a such so much fun. And thank you for asking me. No problem, here. man. Uh, don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I. And you can follow Ashley on Twitter at Ashley V. Robinson. That has been it for Geek History Lesson. I have been Jason Independent Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And we'll see you after the sabbatical, students. <laughs>